It's hard being cool though. Sit like, up it's like and a then responsibility. Mount. It's like a cool no. re- <laughs> like it is. It's a cool responsibility. It's like no, there's a oh, lot of pressure. What is the cool person gonna say? Like I, I it's not. I don't mean to be cool. No, no. but it's you're actually a hundred percent right there. It's like no. No, it's okay. Like it's just like I don't know when they put me in the cool thing, you know, like me and my brother, like the like childhood versions of us would be giggling and cracking up because we were like foreigners, like growing up in different countries together, you know, three years apart, slightly awkward. And um, now we're both really cool. I don't know what that means. (laughs) That means you're cool. I don't know. We're both pretty cool. I mean, you're cool. Um, And you were always cool. And it's nice to see how you have built this incredible business. I'm very proud of you. I'm very proud of Noah. I'm very proud of your children and just knowing lovely people like you. I love you. I love you too. Thank you so much for having me here. My first podcast, and I'm really happy that it's with a friend and someone I care about and believe in and love, and I feel in a safe space. And I think it's super important to be surrounded in safe spaces with people that encourage you, that you can encourage, people that love you and care about you. And uh, kind of like a muscle of support and love. Not long ago, you told me if they're not supporting me, I'm not supporting them. Remember? Mm -hmm. Yes. I mean, first of all, you, thank you. Because everything you just said is the friend you have been to me from like the moment we met. And I have such a vivid memory of that. Do you remember it was in Lavo nightclub in New York and Noah brought me over and he was like, like it was the first time we had ever really talked in depth. Like I, I remembered you from Marquee. But like we didn't really hang out. But I liked your energy. You were always like cheerful and fun and you danced and you worked and you were like, you had a nice energy. And like, I remember that about you. You were kind, you weren't, you know, you were like a girl's girl. Like I always had a nice vibe. So when then I saw you at Lavo and you were finally like Noah's girlfriend, what happened? I don't remember. (laughs) That's okay. It was a long time ago. You came up to me and you were like, it's so nice to finally like talk to you because, you know, I knew you too, but we had never really like sat there and talked. I mean, when you have a conversation at Marquee, you both think you're saying different things. Like you don't really have heartfelt conversations at Marquee. Although we were at Lavo, but it was like... We were in our 20s. It was early. We were in our 20s and it was earlier in the night. So the music wasn't full blown. But you, you like did this thing. And I remember you like, you do, you do this to this day. You like crossed your arms and you like pulled back and you were like, you're going to do something really great. You were like, there's something about you. And I just remember being like, oh, thank you. Like, I almost like, didn't even know how to take it. I think I was just so different and a little insecure and kind of like, I don't know. You, I had been wearing your clothes. Let's also just mention that. I'd been a fan of your brand. Just you were so genuine with me. And truly, like that has just maintain like you've been this truly supportive and I'd love to talk to you about this because I think you and I have had this conversation many times over like there are people in your life who really support you and then there are people in your life who will support you from the surface because of how it looks but they're not really your people and you've always been just like one of my people, one of my true supporters. I am. I'm definitely one of your people and I love it. I love what you've grown into. I've loved watching it. Do you feel like you've done something amazing with your life? I do. I like that. Makes me happy. But I also think it's like a mirror. Like you see beauty in others and then they see beauty in you and then you see beauty in them again and then they see more beauty in you and I I feel like it's an exchange, you know? Mm Mm-hmm. I do. I mean, you've done the same for me as well. You've supported me in the same way. You've believed in me. And it's really nice to see what we've, uh, you know, made of our lives here in New York City. You know? It really is. It's lovely to see that. Um, 
So, it, yeah. Sorry, you go. No, you, so you... Well, we have a whole thing going on in the office, I have to say. Um, people are like, who is going to talk more, Melissa or Ronnie? Because you both talk so much. And I said, like, I don't know. It depends on what topic. And we do both talk so much. And I'm thinking of our dinners together. And we're always, like, screaming and talking over each other. And we love it. And usually, like, a third person with us. But we always, uh, you know, share such a great banter. So uh, it was a kind of a joke in the office who would talk more. <laughs> I love that. That's so good. And we also have like, we have a, a entourage of people watching us too. Oh, but they're not here. What happened to them? No, it's fine. They go behind, you know, it's just like, I want you to feel like we're in this little space together. I, I one thing this having a podcast has helped me to become is a better listener. And I realize even in like the beginning of the podcast, how it's almost uncomfortable sometimes to just sit and listen and feel like there always has to be this act and almost as like the host or I don't even like to think of that. I really just like we're sitting here having a conversation, but it's really helped me to just observe that from listening to it because that's also uncomfortable listening to yourself or watching yourself on you have a lot to say, and you think you, I think you actually promote a lot of positive things. You know, you really promote a lot of self love, self care, movement. Uh, I think that's your first stage, and I think there's a lot more for you. I think you're just at the beginning. I think you know that. And, um, you know, I recognize that in you from the minute I saw you. I thought, like, what a great human. You know, I thought, that's what I thought. And then watching you grow over the pandemic was really, really lovely. It was a really lovely period just to see all the things come together. And you show up in a very professional way. And I have to say, I really admire that. Because someone like me who's gone to like, you know, NYU, graduate and undergraduate, and we, I've studied all this and like, I thought I was prepared for, you know, a certain kind of uh, career. And then I see someone like you who just like seamlessly like, just fell into the shoes and showed up and taught herself everything. Like, really, really, I, I admire you in that, you know? You really deserve it. it. It belongs to you. And I feel like a lot of successes belong to the people that have worked for it. And I don't think that you have not worked hard. Um, you really showed up and worked your, you know, butt off to be where you are today. And it's really wonderful to see what you have created, a real brand around, you know, the things you believe in that are very authentic to you. And people ask me all the time, like, what, what is Melissa like? And I said, really, honestly, that's exactly what she's like. There's like, there's no act. She's always laughing. There's a loud laugh. <laughs> she's a Sagittarius. It's very common among Sagittariuses <laughs> to laugh like this. <laughs> Yeah, it is exactly how she is when there's no cameras. <laughs> she does, you know, find joy in the simplest things like making a green juice. It's really something she enjoys to do. She's not embarrassed to say when she's not feeling herself, right? Mm -hmm. Which has been something that I think you've been sharing with other women. And I see it resonating a lot in your, uh, you know, in your, I guess, I don't want to say fan, you know, because they're not fans. These people are part of your, you know, journey and they're, they're very much part of your method of like meditation, movement, wellness, um, self-care. And uh, now you're showing another vulnerability of yourself and it's listening, which is new, right? Oh, yeah. Saying it's really new. It's nice to hear you say that because I'm in the same place too. <laughs> so should we just like listen to each other and not talk? <laughs> Because I actually am I'm in a listening phase right now, too. I'm it's feeling good. like I don't know everything. Oh. And I think that people who are listening are learning more, you know? So they're, 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 I'm there, too. Well, we can be here together. I mean, honestly, it's beautiful. It's, it's been like, it's been expanding me in different directions to just be so present and it like locks you into what you're doing. So it's it's a good thing. I want to go, I think, back to younger Ronnie Kobo. You grew up in New York. And just like seeing the evolution of Ronnie Kobo and, and you, like knowing you now and, and even 14 years ago when I met you, like just everything has evolved and elevated 
I'm wearing your blazer now. That is so insane. Thank you. I'm really proud of that blazer because like I was scared of making a really good blazer because I have like very high expectations from myself, my team, my vision. And like, I really needed to nail the blazer and seeing it on you you looks awesome. You nailed it. I think I did. You did. You nailed it. It's a good tux. And you're just like, you have always been my style icon. Like, I feel like you just, you get it. So where did that come from? Um, where did it come from? I I don't want to sound like, uh, like we've been hearing a lot of like empowering, empowering females. What does it mean? I really, truly have a, a brand that I feel like when you wear it, you feel empowered, you feel individual. I feel like I give that, uh, the Ronnie Coble girl, when she wears something, she's kind of competing by on her own with no one. She's feeling individual. Mm. She's feeling confident. She's feeling sexy. She's feeling bold. And um, it's kind of a conversational piece. Whatever I make, I feel like ends up being a conversational piece. So it started with, you know, um, what was the question again? (laughs) How did it start? Yeah. I mean, you grew up in New York. I I don't... I grew up in Hong Kong, which is like, you know, uh, a lot of people don't know that about me. Uh, My father was... uh, one of the early pioneers of the denim industry. And he was um, one of the uh, very brave uh, foreigners who embarked on the journey of an American dream. So he uh, lived between, we lived between New York and uh, Hong Kong. And we went to school in Hong Kong. And uh, I kind of grew up going to work with my dad in factories uh, on weekends. Uh, He had a work ethic like me. So he worked late at night and on weekends and traveled around the world like it was having breakfast in a coffee shop. And um, how I started making things was um, I lived in Hong Kong and we went to cotillion classes. I grew up going to an American school, which is why I have an American accent. My sister had a British accent, which was really cute. And my brother had like an international accent, still does. Um, Sometimes he speaks British and sometimes (laughs) he's very American. And it just depends on who he's talking to. Um, I was always a chameleon. So I had like loved the Protestant school we went to and uh, learned a lot of like very traditional middle American like values, all American values and... uh, that's why I really identified with the American culture. So when I moved to the States, it was like seamless transition. How old were you? When you I was uh, 16 when I moved okay. to the States. So 15. You so you grew up entirely in Hong Kong? Yes. I mean, we tried, there was a year, you know, in the first grade and a year in the fourth grade where we tried to move to the States, but my father really kept on going back to Hong Kong. And okay. I, I grew up in a place uh, where product was everything. Mm -hmm. My father was rumored to have invented stretch denim. And I think it's changed a lot and Mm -hmm. it goes into trends. And right now it's a lot about marketing the product. We, you know, are buying a lot of similar products these days and they're just marketed a different way. And marketing is actually a fascinating part of uh, what I consider packaging. Mm. You know, and it's not just making great product, sadly. There's also marketing great product. And marketing has a truth serum to it because there's something that's very, um, what's the word? There's something that media does. It's sort of like a truth serum. You can really spot something that's not authentic, Mm -hmm. especially in your field. I'm sure you can spot things that are not authentic in the wellness field Mm -hmm. and whether or not you are critical of them, it's or not, or, Mm -hmm. you know, I'm sure you can spot something that's not authentic. Same with designers. You know, we can spot each other. We can spot like each other's strengths. Marketing is so important because it gives the message of what you're trying to say. So it's beyond the product. Culture is so important these days. Culture, meaning, we're in a place in the world where we really want to create meaning with, you know, what brands we support and why and, you know, um, sustainability, which I have not yet embarked on um, the way that I would have liked to. Um, So I'd make dresses for cotillion class and I had girls who I would make dresses for 
And I almost enjoyed making dresses for them more than myself because I loved making people feel good. And I think that's how it all started. It just gave me a little high to see like, you know, to look at a female and like make her feel good and like be part of that experience. Mm. I loved it. That's who you still are to this day. Yes, it's that's who I still am. And I was listening to you talk about like who we've evolved to, but I'm always scaling back and trying to go back to who I've always been in my heart because that person, that girl always leads me in the right places. And I feel like we grow up, we're exposed to so much, we learn and we grow, but there's something that can never, ever leave you. And it's just who you are and why you're there. A hundred percent. So I'm genuinely not like embarrassed to say, I love making people feel great. It's like my role in my family. It's uh, my role with my friends. Like I just, I'm a giver. I love making people feel great. It makes me happy. It just, it's just something that I love doing. And it started in the clothing and, um, and then it became theatrical at times and it became emotional and it became an experience just to see, you know, the process of making things. Mm -hmm. It's really exciting. It really, really is. Especially now uh, we're a week, you know, uh, we're a week before fashion week and slowly I'm seeing my designs trickling in and I'm getting into the mood and it's a very inspiring, like, high. I mean, I just watching you create something like coming to your office years ago. I mean, I guess it was last year for my 40th when you created, when you like did my birthday dress and just like watching how you are when you're in your essence. It's so powerful to see like what comes to life because I think that's probably like one of my biggest questions when it comes to fashion and designing. Like you have to design so much so far in advance. Like you probably already have, I mean, you already have holiday done. Well, I'm always right? late. No, I don't have holiday. <laughs> and I'm for, I was just got a lecture from my team about being late with that. Oh. Um, holiday starts next week. Okay. And it's my favorite. It is. I think like pretty much nail holiday because it's just one big happy party and it's celebrations and it's feeling great and it's feeling empowered and it's feeling sexy and it's feeling conversational and it's, you know, celebratory, which I, I love a celebration. Mm -hmm. I love a celebration. You're so good at the celebratory. I mean, I, there... I, I don't think you've ever created anything that I've been like, no, like I'm just like, everything hits. How do you, how do you keep it? How do you keep yourself inspired? Like, do you go to shows? Do you go, like, where do you get the most? Like inspiration is everywhere. My first company, I did handbags and I was inspired by tapestries and they were so beautiful. And I would buy vintage tapestries and make these beautiful handbags. I have one that I still keep and I, I love it. I'll send you a picture if you want to yeah. put it in I this see. whole reel, whatever, yeah, you know, I see. this podcast. It's beautiful. And um, I'm inspired by anything. I'm inspired by life. But um, lately I'm inspired a lot by vintage and history. And uh, obviously I'm known for being inspired by the 80s and 90s. And that's kind of where I grew up in Asia. And it was a very glamorous uh, lifestyle at the time. Uh, everybody dressed up and it was a melting pot of ethnicities. There was not one culture that you would say was dominant. There was people from all over the world. It was very interesting to see so many people living in such a trans transit city. Mm -hmm. um, also, people didn't stay very long. So you only had friends for a small window and uh, you had friends for two years, three years, and then they would move. Uh, there were a lot of IBM families, expats, uh, people, very few in fashion was in my school, but there was a lot of banking families. It was, you know, the 90s in, in, in Hong Kong. So mm. it was everything that you can think of. It was also a British colony at the time. So uh, it was very interesting. It, there was a handover in 97 and uh, we were already gone by then. Mm -hmm. uh, we just left. So it's changed a lot, but it's still just that magical place. If you think New York City's fast-paced, 
You have not been to Hong Kong. I've been to Hong Kong once for like five days. And I was like, this is insane. Uh, We lived in the countryside. Okay. So it was a lot chiller. Uh, It was actually, a lot of my childhood looked like a tropical island because uh, it's a very plush island. Uh, Hong Kong is, it rains like 50% of the time. So it was very plush and uh, it was surrounded by water. You know, people don't know that about living in Hong Kong that like we were always like barefoot on the beach, exploring in like the mountains. You know, um, one of the things we used to do when we got a little bit older was we would just take a bus that didn't have uh, English writing on it. So, you know, you were going to like a total foreign kind of community, um, not foreign, but you were going to more of like a less, uh, the time we said Guaylo, which is like white community. I was a Guaylo, you know, but it was less white and it was more uh, Asian. And we'd go to these like cities that were like mini cities that were just all Asian and there'd be no one uh, that we would know and we would just misbehave, skateboard and misbehave. And that's, you know, my last year in in Hong Kong was that just jumping on, you know, Asian buses and going to like communities that were not, um, you know, Caucasian and just being like a teenager, which was super fun. It's so funny because I know you've talked about Hong Kong before, but I always thought that you were there for a shorter period and then came to New York and like would go back and visit your dad. I didn't realize that you, like that was like your whole childhood. Yeah, it was. It was. It was my whole childhood. And it's Chinese New Year around the corner. And, um, you know, I I really like, I feel it. It's part of my culture. I love Chinese culture. Mm. So respectful. It's, uh, the Chinese people are like incredible people. They're so loyal. Um, love doing business with, uh, with Asian, with Chinese people. I just love it. I love the code. There's a little bit of like a mob wife to me sometimes or not my wife or just because I'm really big on loyalty and honesty. And, um, I really get that ethic from the friendships I've made in Asia. Um, almost all of the factories that I work with are female owned. Um, the majority are, and they're all young, uh, really hungry, really creative, really, really amazing women who make beautiful clothing with me. Uh, We do a production also in uh, other countries, but I just love, I love China. I love it. I love it. I remember going to a factory for the first time and I was like, oh, like this is, it's wild when you like actually see how product is created wild. I do. I create product here because I'm such a product junkie. I created on 37th Street and there used to be such an interesting uh, production culture on what they call like uh, the garment district. Mm -hmm. There were a lot of factories. Sadly, there's less and less. Um, But I make a lot of things in the garment center. I have a lot of factories that I have great relationships with. And we have a lot of, uh, you know, very interesting evenings together making product, which is just what I love to do. It's what you love doing, like aside from just designing. Right. It's like who you surround yourself with, right? And the... I always thought I'd be a writer, like on the side. That was like my true passion was to write. And um, my biggest fear was making denim because I had a lot to live up to. And this is my first season that I'm launching a proper denim line. And uh, I think you're going to love it. I'm so excited. I love the denim that you've created already. Thank you. It's a, it's a big uh, pressure because I come from a, like such a, a denim family. And my dad hasn't been in the business for almost 30 years, maybe even more actually. But it's, uh, he still has it. It's like something that you always have. Like I just flashed him a picture of my first denim the other day, like the real launch. And he called me back so inspired and like sleepless. He needed to talk to me. And he was like, you're missing a really good logo on the back of the jean. And now we're entering this trend where everything is like less logos, more, you know, quiet luxury. Right. I'm sure you've been hearing that word a lot. A lot. The quiet luxury. What does that mean? Yeah. What does that mean? Quiet luxury. You're talking to someone who's such a novelty freak. Um, who really likes to like, you know, stand out in a room and likes women to stand out in a room. Mm-hmm. So uh, quiet luxury is definitely not 100% who 
you know, my personal aesthetic is, although I can appreciate it and its simplicity and its elegance, but it's also so important to be authentic to yourself. Thank you. And just say like, you know what? I can appreciate this. And I do, you know, I'm dressed, I guess, in a quiet luxury kind of way today, which is, you know, who uh, I guess, you I guess it's like trendy. Today. I guess it's what I felt like doing. I mean, it's what I wore to work today. And honestly, I didn't have time to go back and change. <laughs> so I made it work. It's great. Um, but um, quiet luxury is good quality. And I think that stems from the marketing that we have Okay, this is actually good because quiet luxury is quality. And I think that we've done a lot of impulse purchasing on Instagram, on Facebook, online. And I think that the marketing really took over from the product. Mm -hmm. And I think it became too much. We had the pandemic with the sweats and the sweats and the sweats, which I love more than anything. That's something you don't know about me. Um, But I think from the quiet luxury, We needed some real good quality. We didn't just want to like buy into, you know, an image. We wanted to buy into quality, longevity, uh, price point, you know, really like be wise with where we're spending our money. And I can totally appreciate quiet luxury, really can. But I can totally be honest with myself and say that's not where I am. Like I have great quality. I mean, our clothing is great quality and we strive for quality, but I don't think I'm quite a quiet luxury brand and I I don't want to be. I'm happy in my space. I'm happy what I've created and I want to create, you know, a bigger world from what I know how to do. I love that. Not try to be anyone else, you know, because like me is good and me is awesome and someone else is awesome, you know, and quiet luxury brands are awesome. I, I love them. I, I personally like to buy quiet luxury for myself mm-hmm. because it lasts longer and because I have such a good eye for, you know, clothing and for execution. And, you know, I really can appreciate, the, you know, spending my money wisely. Quality over quantity, I feel like has been such a movement and I'm so happy to see it because even like thinking back to like you said during the pandemic and it was like, the sweats and the tie-dye. And I would love like what you said about even just like maintaining authenticity with self, like trends are like, like right now, for instance, with like the mob wives trend and everyone, I'm like, can can we all just not look like everybody else? Like, can we have our own sense of self? Like, I enjoy elements of trends and things trending. Don't get me wrong. Like, and I am definitely, I enjoy quiet luxury moments, but like when I go out, I don't want to be quiet. <laughs> like I, I've always well, you loved. Don't need, it's funny because you don't need much because you're such a beautiful woman and you have such a beautiful energy and you look so beautiful with nothing on your face and nothing on your hair, in your hair and like just natural but, you know, it's nice to see someone who has all those beautiful gifts that can actually, like, want to dress up and be extra at night. It's fun to watch yeah. you. It is. I love that. But you don't need much. And quiet luxury would actually really, really suit you very well. But I also appreciate you supporting smaller brands and being, uh, you know, authentic to who you are. You never look like you're trying to look like someone else. No, I really don't think I am. And that's really important because we live in New York City and it's so easy to get caught up in what's in fashion and what's trendy. I mean, the New York City girls, they dress like no one else. I mean, they really do. They have the best style. They are so beautiful. They're all super intelligent. They all have these, and most of them have these fabulous careers. And if they don't have these fabulous careers, they're amazing moms or, you know, they have amazing hobbies or talents and they have great style. And I think a great style comes from intelligence. And from authenticity and from a sense of humor, I think even. I I like to not take myself too seriously. And if you know me, you know I'm always laughing and I'm always making jokes. And I think that my clothing is a reflection of that. It is. I feel like going back to like what you're saying, like to me, it's everything I wear, of yours, it just feels like a statement. <laughs> and I love making a statement with the way that I dress. It's not about 
necessarily standing out in a room or it might be sometimes, but I just like it for myself. Like it's not even about Thank you. for other people. Do you know what Thank I mean? You. It makes you like, like when you were like, what are you wearing? And I'm like, I like to get dressed. I like to dress for this because it helps me show up. And like, I feel like this is such an important topic for young men and women, I think entering the workforce. Like when you get dressed, you feel a certain way and you bring that essence and that energy to to walking into that interview. It's not about the brands you're wearing. It is about the confidence within yourself. And clothing has the ability to transform you into feeling powerful. 100%. 100%. I can't tell you how much I agree with that. 100%. I I mean, that's why I'm in it, I think. There's one of the many reasons why I'm in it. There's also a high, you know, there's a high you get when you're, you know, executing something and there's a high from failing that, you know, if you're someone who's not afraid of failing and I am not afraid of failing, I failed so many times and it's just like a lesson learned and, you know, you get up, you pick yourself up and you just, you know, failing is like, failing for me is success, Mm -hmm. truly. Every time I fail, I feel like I'm closer to success and like, yeah. My family always jokes around about like me not being scared to fail because I've failed a lot. I've tried a lot of businesses as a child growing up and you can look at it as a failure, but I look at it as a portfolio. Ooh. Yeah. For me, it's a portfolio. A portfolio of experiences, of lessons, you know, lessons of yourself and lessons of interactions with other people, lessons of even execution. Like if you see what i you know, what we're executing this season from, you know, 10 years ago, it's like, I've really evolved. And oh, yeah. that's awesome. It's a great feeling. It shows that I'm not like tired, that I have a lot more in me. Mm. And I've always had that kind of fight, whether it's in life. And I know we're talking about the elephant in the room, <laughs> which I really no, want to say do. that. I want to talk about the elephant in the room because... It's not why you have me here. No. I know that. But I know that. I know that, like, because I know that because I've worked a lot on being great. You know, I wasn't always just like you. Maybe that's how we connect. I wasn't always confident. It's kind of awkward. And uh, and then I became overly confident because, like, I was trying to be confident, Mm -hmm. you know? Yes. And then I, like, realized I wasn't really confident. And then I realized what confidence is. And like, I have to say, I'm really confident. I really am. I mean, we have insecure moments. We have moments where we're questioning ourselves, but that's not insecurity. It's just being humble, you know, just just wanting to be better, to grow. Um, So the elephant in the room is interesting because it's around this time. So it's a very triggering time for me in, uh, in general. It's been four years and everyone always asks me, Ronnie, why do your fall collection so great? Because when I'm designing fall, it's around the time that everything happened in my life that really changed the way that I looked at things. And um, I like to dive into creativity. It's very healing for me just to, I don't want to say be distracted, but like do something positive with overthinking and remembering like I think everyone who's gone through some kind of sadness in their lives or some kind of trauma, I think when they uh, they enter that time or that month, I remember I used to have someone very close to me who lost their father in March. They know who they are uh, if they ever see this. And I remember in March, their personalities totally changed. And it was like even the month leading up to March because the trauma was so, so... Uh, strong in their bodies and in their nostalgia that the month of March meant something it, like maybe the season or the smell in the air or whatever you were eating or somebody's birthday that that month or was it Valentine's Day or was it whatever it is really brings you back. So this is the time in my life that, you know, my health failed me. 
And it's really, really funny because next week it's going to be February 4th. I'm sure this is probably going to air not then, but mm-hmm. next week is going to be February 4th. And that's when, um, you know, I found out that I, when, when I was diagnosed with um, fallopian tube cancer, which is a form of ovarian cancer. There's been studies that say ovarian cancer starts in the fallopian tubes. And uh, my cancer was a fallopian tube cancer, which is really rare. It's, at the time, it was 5% in the world. Mm. And it was really funny because I'm like, of course, like me, like I, if you know me, I'm always in like the weirdest places at the weirdest times. Um, like I was in the tsunami in the beach in Thailand. Like... I was really close to uh, 9-11, you know, the Twin Towers. Um, I was in a weird airplane situation once. Like, I just, I'm in weird places um, quite often. Like, so, uh, of course, like, you know, I had, like, one of the most hardcore, like, cancers you could have. You know, I didn't even, like, I didn't even imagine in my wildest fears and dreams that that would be something I would have to... uh, experience. It was just so profound. I really understood so many different things that, you know, I don't want to say we took it for granted. I took, you know, we, we do, we take our health for granted. We do. You don't, you don't. One of my team members here, I met on Zoom um, when I, you know, was going through chemo. And I remember like putting a wig on and like putting a hat on and like, meeting this young hipster artist, you know, and it was just, um, I think like 45 minutes after the conversation, I was like, oh, by the way, I just wanted to tell you like, um, you know, like I have cancer. It's like, so I would tell the weirdest people at the weirdest times. You told me at the weirdest, like I still to this day was like, how did I tell you? It was all a blur. You... We were on the phone and you just said it like, I have cancer. And I was like, what? Like, and our conversation was short because I think you were going to, there was something like that you weren't saying on the phone. And then you text me and you're like, I'm sorry. By the way, it became for Melissa's career, just like right at the beginning of Melissa's career, because my diagnosis was February 4th, 2020. So it was a month before the pandemic. And um, it was a month before the pandemic. Yeah. It's crazy. So the world changed and everybody's lives were different. You know, Melissa, you, you blew up overnight. You moved in with Dylan. <laughs> <laughs> Dylan became your wife. <laughs> and you had like a really great little... <laughs> Dylan was so cute with you, right? <laughs> kids must like, and my kids must like so attached to her. They love Dylan. <laughs> they, they, if she came around more, just kidding. And everyone <laughs> during the pandemic went on a journey. Like everyone had their own journey. Um, yeah, I remember like telling a lot of people, but the one person who was the most vivid in my memory to tell was probably um, my mother. It was very difficult to tell my mother that. I remember that um, that morning, because I'm usually with an entourage, as I told you, like my family, everyone. I'm just, I just like an entourage. I'm like a happy bus person, like rather than like being in a car alone. So um, I remember the doctor asked me, oh, you're with no one today. And I was like, yeah. And I remember, I don't know why, but I remember I lied. I remember I told the doctor, my mother's in Florida. I don't know why I lied. I just did. It was like something weird and awkward. The funny part about it was because my mother ended up coming after 45 minutes and she was clearly not in Florida. But um, calling your my mother, I don't know. I haven't heard other people who've been through that talk about like telling their family members. I think that's the most difficult part about being sick is telling your family members. Because you break their hearts and you don't do it on purpose, but the situation breaks their hearts. And um, calling my mom was like probably the hardest part of like being the, the hardest like 
stages of, of, of cancer. You know, um, I never spoke about it and I don't speak about it a lot because I always say like, I didn't want it to define me for some reason. I don't know what that meant. I was like, it's not going to define me. It's not going to change. It's like my sister, when she first had her child, she was like, I'm the same. I'm not going to change. I'm like, okay. A month later, did you change that? Now she's like totally, you know, different person, but it's, um, you know, I didn't want it to define me. So I remember when the doctor first told me and he first checked my, my, my stomach to, sh- to see my stitches for my surgery. And he then said, you know, come to the room after to talk about it. And as he was checking my, my, my stomach, he was like, oh, I've done a lot of Victoria's Secret models. I remember it was like awkward. I was, why is he <laughs> telling sad. me that? Because it's awkward. I feel bad for the doctors. I mean, they have to, you know, basically they, they you know, they have to tell patients you know, the truth and they had, they have the, they're, they're changing their lives and their fates and their, you know, we, we see that on slow motion. I don't know who, I don't know if I speak for everyone who's been di- diagnosed with an illness, but for me, there's a lot of grace, but what is clear as yesterday was the morning I was walking in the hospital and I remember seeing the doctor and he was behind me and he was pretending not to see me. And I remember thinking, oh, he's so unfriendly. And then I went into the room and then he checked my belly and he told me that he did Victoria's Secret models and you can't see the stitches because you really can't. But, you know, and then he brings me into the room and then all of a sudden the PA comes, her name I forgot. And then she's staring at the wall and then he starts drawing. And he's looking at his drawing and he's drawing, an, you know, the ovaries, fallopian tube. And I was like, no way. I said to myself, no way. And as a, I, I don't know if I was joking, if I was serious, because I joke all the time. And I said, doc, are you going to tell me I have cancer? Like, stop drawing. Just tell me, are you going to tell me I have cancer? And he was like, yes. I was like, wow. And I, I remember everything word for word. And I said, the dangerous kind? And he said, yes. I said, am I going to need another surgery? And he said, yes. Am I going to be able to have children? He said, I don't know. I said, am I dying? He said, I don't know. And then I said, am I going to have to do chemo? And he said, yes. And I said, the kind that makes your hair fall out? And he said, Yes. I was like, oh, wow. And there was a silence. And the PA was like looking, like not at me. She was young. She was like my age. And I understood that this wasn't something that young women go through quite often. Monica, stop crying. I love you. You cute thing, you. Oh my God, I, I love that. you. Sorry, this, there's just no. people that you work with that you get to know because you just like work together. Don't cry. It's a happy story, girl. Don't cry. It's a very happy story. It's a happy story because, you know, a lot of people don't sit here with that kind of cancer with their beautiful friends who are like, and get to tell the story. And like, it's okay if it defines me because like, I'm a badass. And like, I'm okay. Like being a badass. Excuse my language. I don't know if I'm no, supposed to No, it's okay. To you can say anything you want. I will never forget what I said next. And it really was something that came out of me because you really learn about yourself later when you look back at it. And I said, it's okay. Because the doctor is like, what is she going to say? And I'm like, it's okay. I said to him, and he was like, okay. And I was like, I'm that girl. He was like, what? I'm like, you don't know me, doc. You don't know me. But I'm that girl. I'm that girl who can go through all this. And like, it's not shocking that this is my journey because I can go through this. He said, okay, the next step is like discussing chemo. They're very like, you know, let's discuss chemo. Let's discuss surgery. Let's discuss options. I was like, can I call my family? And then I remember calling my mom and it was 8 a.m., it's right before Fashion Week, uh, a month before Fashion Week. It was 8 a.m. And I called my mother and I said, Mom, listen, how did you sleep? And she was like, okay. I'm like, well, I'm at the doctor's and uh, I just want you to come and get dressed. I just want, I'll never forget this. <laughs> they just found a little bit of cancer 
nothing to worry about. It's going to be okay. Just like, I think you should come and get dressed so we can talk about it. And she's like, cancer, like a little bit. Of, she was, I said, just get dressed. We'll come and talk about it. And, uh, and then she came, uh, with, she was in the hospital with my whole family and spouse was, was, uh, was there within 20 minutes. And uh, the next steps were quite cold. I think a lot of people who, you know, have experienced cancer or illness or you know, any autoimmune can say that the doctors are cold. You know, they do it all day. They really do. Do it all day. I don't want to say they become desensitized to it. And definitely was much sadder seeing a young woman. You know, I, I don't know if it's much sadder seeing a young woman. I think it's sad across the board. It's sad seeing a mother. It's sad seeing a grandmother. It's sad seeing a child. It's sad. Sickness is sad, period. And um, the rest of it was very cold. There was like chemo 101. And then I realized at that minute who in my family and in my life was going to be part of that journey. And one of my best friends was there. She was hysterical. I love her. But she wasn't you know, she wasn't there for the first few months of the journey because it was, it was too much. Um, it was too, it was too hard on her. Uh, my sister was just like amazing. My brother was the best. Uh, my man was amazing. He was really, really one of the most beautiful people I can ever express. Probably, you know, he was amazing really made me feel beautiful, made me feel, you know, in control, not scared. It's really important to have good people around you because like, you know, but you set the tone, you set the tone, you do. It's very much about you setting the tone. I looked at my mother during chemo 101 and her face contorted and she looked maybe like 10 years older at that minute. And there was muscles that were pulling her face down, which is a lot of the work that you do with like muscle work and your face. It's really like it just pulled her face and she looked like a different person. And I said to myself, okay, I looked at my mother and I said, I can't take her on this journey with me. You can't have too much. I couldn't take her. It would age her too much. Mm. God forbid, it would make her sick, you know? Right. And I think that it's a very hard thing for a mother to see is, is their child sick? I think it's one of the worst things. It's one of your biggest nightmares. Your biggest nightmare is to see your child sick. Okay. You know? So I let her go in a really clever way and, uh, you know, decided to go through it, you know, not with her, which was okay. Didn't make her bad mom, which is the best. Didn't make her, you know, anything less to me, except that someone who didn't need to be on that journey with me. I wanted to protect her. I noticed that about you through just like knowing that you were, it felt like silently going through it because no one really knew. Like you didn't tell a lot of people. There were like very, very few people. Um, but it made me realize something about you that like, you know, you're always there and support everyone and always checking in. But like when it came to you, like you, you didn't, it felt like, I mean, you can share how that felt, but it felt like you didn't want to put that burden on anyone. It was the pandemic. Uh, everyone was going through a lot. A lot of people lost a lot of family members. A lot of people were scared. Um, and I didn't know what my fate was. You know, there's um, something that I'd like, I think a lot of people who have cancer, you know, not sure if they share a lot of it, but getting diagnosed with cancer is the first step. Then there's another step of knowing, like, where is it? What stage are you? How long do you have to live? Do you have a chance? Do you not? And there's that time period, which I think is probably the worst part of being diagnosed with cancer. I don't know about other illnesses, but I can definitely tell you the time where you get your biopsy and you get your surgeries or, you know, there's a, there's a waiting period where you wait weekend upon weekend. And that Friday when you don't get the answer, you know, you have to wait till Monday and anyone who has any sick family members or have waited for a doctor to get back to you from Friday to Monday, when you don't get the answer on Friday, it really, really is not fun. And waiting for the answer along the weekend, 
So I had two full weeks of waiting to know, like, did I have a chance? Do I even go through chemo? I mean, and, mm -hmm. you know, and um, learning that I had a chance, learning what to do with my time those two weeks and how to sleep and how to breathe. And the unknown was really, really like the waiting period was really intense. So I didn't really want to tell a lot of people because I didn't know what to say. And again, I don't want to break, don't want to break people's hearts. Like it's kind of sad, you know, your cheerful friend who like loves you and supports you and your family member and your wife and whatever. You just don't want to break anyone's hearts, you know? You want them happy, people that you love. And when they think that you might not be there, it's very scary. So I didn't tell a lot of people. I was also like, um, you know, very like hung up about my hair, which was like so stupid because a lot of people will say, a lot of females will say that, like they're really hung up about their hair, losing it. Some people are like really cool. I wasn't, definitely was not cool. I was very graceful. I have to say like, if there's qualities in myself that I can say that I definitely own and have the portfolio say I have, I think it was grace. I remember after the whole uh, chemo period and, you know, when it was over, the doctor said to me, I have to tell you something. He said, out of all my patients, you're the first, you're the, you've uh, portrayed the most uh, growth from anyone. I was pretty hysterical after I told him I was the one. Then I became like super hysterical and I went into, you know, a phase of like hysteria. And I probably, you know, buzzed him a couple, little too many times and it's probably like, not as sensitive. But then I became very graceful after I was very ungraceful. I became very graceful and I think I'm a very graceful female. And I think that is uh, something I have the portfolio to say that, yeah. That I'm, is I'm graceful. I'm a graceful female. You are a graceful woman. I went through it pretty great. Thank you. I went through it pretty gracefully. What can you say about yourself? We'll go back to it. But like, what can you say you have earned the portfolio for being? Like, let's go back and forth and like, like love each other right now because we deserve it. What can you say, Melissa Wood Health Tepperberg. No. <laughs> Melissa Wood Tepperberg. It's okay. I thought you grew Help. up in New York. No. <laughs> what can you like say that you love, that you, you have a portfolio and you can say that it's a good quality about yourself and you have the portfolio? You can go three, four, five. Like, you don't say one thing. You can just you can go back and forth. I think my ability um, of acceptance, of really accepting myself through all the phases, all the journeys, all the growth, and to still really come out the other end, just like loving all of me. And it, that wasn't always the case, you know? So sad when I see someone like Melissa saying that because you're such a beautiful person on the inside and the outside. And I'm not just saying that because I'm one of your closest friends. You really are a beautiful person. You're very nice. You're very kind. You're like very soulful. You know how to apologize. I don't forget that. Like you apologized to me once and I'll never forget it. It was so genuine and sincere. And I forgave you like instantly because, and I never even looked back because you, the way that you apologize is just so sincere. And um, I apologize for not being there during this time. Stop it. It's true because I, I didn't feel it's such, it's a very interesting thing to experience when someone that you love tells you. And I, you know, I had Chris Carr on and she spoke about her cancer experience and grieving. And I am so comfortable to share how wildly uncomfortable it is for me when people get sick or how to handle loss. Like, and I, I feel truly through like the journey of like, I'll never forget. We all had dinner and you were telling me about the cap that you were wearing for your hair, which by the way, also just let me know about the strength that you have within knowing how cold it was. I want to tell you that. To, I think that's really important. Like, I think that's like one of the main reasons I'm here. Like besides the fact that like it's really fun to talk about like 
to talk with you, first of all, it's really fun. But I think one of the most important reasons I'm here is to talk about that whole hair thing, because I don't think uh, a lot of people know about that, you know, that you can actually save your hair um, when you're going through chemotherapy. I was not the success story, but at the time I thought I was, I had a few hairs like left on my head and I really like, you know, felt I was a success story. I was a medium, like you can have a lot of success. I wasn't, I was okay. I was actually very grateful to have some hair. I think I shared some pictures with you. Um, but um, I think it's the, I think that as we, I think one of the most traumatizing things about being sick is looking in the mirror and seeing a sick person. And that's just something I didn't want to accept being sick because it was the pandemic and we were in a home with family and children and I didn't want to accept looking in the mirror and seeing, wow, that's chemo, Ronnie. And I used to feel like that in the mirror in the morning. Like, like sometimes I'd wake up in the morning and I'd look in the mirror and I was just like, oh, who is that? Like, wow, look at your eyebrows and you don't have any. And, you're, you know, you, the way that you see your eyelashes, you don't have any. Like, you see your eyes very raw and you see your skin different color. And, you know, wow, thank God for makeup. You know what? Because quickly after I would look in the mirror in the morning, I would transform. And I would, you know, funniest, the most down to earth, most like makeup free person gave me advice right before chemo. He said to me, you know, one of my photographers, he said to me, you know, Ronnie, I'm going to give you some advice. And I thought he was going to give me like something like, you know, that I was going to take with me, that it was really going to, it was really funny. He said, he hates makeup. He hates like anything like extra. And he said, listen his sister had gone through it. He said, listen, the second you wake up in the morning, run to the bathroom and put on makeup. That was his advice to me right before that I, I went through it, through chemo. And I thought to myself, what is he saying? You know, because a lot of people say a lot of weird things. So I didn't really think about it until like, you know, after the second time, the second time that I did it, and you start, you know, looking different and things start falling out. And, you know, and I was like, wow, okay. And, he was right. And uh, the second the second I woke up, I ran to the bathroom with my sister's son. He was the only one up uh, that early. And I would literally paint my face. And I would show up for breakfast with a lot of makeup and, you know, nice outfit. And it made me feel better. Mm -hmm. It and does. A little bit of hair on my head, just enough not to like feel sorry for myself or look at my you know, family looking at me with fear or sorrow and like, you know, still feel like an attractive woman. And I have to say, I'm really an attractive woman. <laughs> you are. I am. <laughs> you know, I never felt attractive before because like, I, you're always like insecure and like my, my nose or my skin and like, whatever, you know, you're not like, you don't love yourself all the time. But I think that really taught me confidence. And I remember like, when I would do treatment, I would, you know, tell the nurses, I would tell them, you know, in my real life, I'm a really pretty girl. <laughs> and they would giggle. I would tell that to the nurses because like, I never called myself a pretty woman before. Mm. You know, I was like, I recognized that. That's, I was really pretty. I was like, you know what? I don't care if you think I'm pretty. I function as a pretty person. <laughs> and I wanted the nurses to know that for some reason and they were cool I, know, I remember all their names I never went back to see them but I remember all their names so if every one of my nurses you know if this comes across one of my nurses I want them to know how much uh I appreciate them one day I'll get the courage to come say hello you're not only just beautiful on the outside you're so stunningly gorgeous <laughs> on the inside and that's what everyone sees. It's well, it just a, takes one to know one. It takes one to know one. Thank really, you. Really, really. It takes one to know one. Thank you for sharing. Anyone who says you're not beautiful has a problem because it's not true. <laughs> you're one of the most beautiful people. You are. That's okay. I am finally in a place where I thankfully 
I'm not looking to others for validation of self anymore. And it's liberating. You know, I think just... Well, you've also built this amazing empire. You've done things for yourself. You've shown up for yourself. You've built this incredible, you know, platform for yourself. And it's not just business. It's mother, you know, you're, you're a mother, it's a wife. It's, it's um, the way you've decided to show up for life. So like, you shouldn't care what people say because you know what? You're trying your best. I am. You and really are. We all are, right? I hope. We try. Some you know? of us, right? But to be we able try. to identify that in other people and... We mess up and we pick up and we try again, right? Yes. Oh, I have to share one story. Tell me. That I'll never forget of you. And then I want to close oh with God, just asking you one me. last thing. Talk about you. No, what, no, it's something you said to me. I went to, you were, you, I went to your showroom on Madison Avenue when you were showing at that beautiful space. And I was so upset. And I was like, oh, I just had the worst interview. It was awful. And you go, good. <laughs> and I was like, what? You go, no, no, it's good. It's good for you to go through those. Like, you can't just be up here all the time. Yeah, like you can't just be, like, loved everywhere you go and, like, you know, adored and say the right thing and, like, be so funny. Like, sometimes you got to, you know, <laughs> get a beating. I got beat. But, but you, you, were, you it made you a bad... Didn't it make you, like... Didn't you learn so much from that? So much, but you... So much what, more but, than, like, being... Right? Yes, but what you said to me was also what I needed to hear. Like... I actually didn't need sympathy. I just needed to be like, okay, great. Like it was tough, right? But like you made it off the other side and it was just, I feel like that's just something that we've always that shared that, in my life. I love. hate that you had that experience. Like I hate that somebody interviewed you and didn't like make you feel good. Uh -huh. And like a lot of the times- Not everyone does. But it's like, you know, it's, maybe it's like a journalist thing. Like I, 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 I dabbled in that in school uh, for a, a minute. Uh, a second, actually. Um, <laughs> and you, you're taught to be very critical. Yes. You know? And question. And, and question. And there's almost a hardness. And I feel like we really need to seek out these, you know, the softness. And yeah. I think that's why, like, some people, like, I think people like, you know, Oprah, or you, my, my Mopra, as I call you, um, I feel like it's really important to... Um, be soft with people. Mm. That's what brings me right and, to the last question for you is what does it mean to you to move with your heart? I feel like it's, uh, for me, it means to connect to my feminine uh, energy. I, I mean, don't get me wrong. I love my masculine, but like I'd like to move with my heart with my feminine energy. Mm. Feminine heart is divine. It's, it's a like divine, it's a divine power. So uh, moving with my heart is moving with my feminine energy, m moving with compassion, moving with grace, moving with intuition. And if I didn't already say gratitude, with, with deep gratitude for being able to experience life the way that I am experiencing it. I'm so grateful for you. Me Thank too. you so much for sharing your story so gracefully because I hope it helps anyone else going through this journey or watching a loved one go through it um, with more hope. Before we finish, I just want to say thank you first and foremost. And uh, one more thing about the cold capping, which I think that people are going to probably want to hear about. Um, people who are young, the reality is right now, more young and more young females are um, getting diagnosed, sadly, with cancer. And a lot of them are young mothers. And a lot of them, hair is important. And uh, there's a lot of ways that you can preserve your hair. Um, I did it through cold capping, a company called Penguin. Um, and uh, what I did was essentially uh, change my cap every 25 minutes. It was a negative 37 degrees. And I sat with that for 11 hours. And 
I always say that was worse than the chemo, but I would still do it again because saving my hair was the only thing I could control in the crazy situation. And um, it was also uh, something that made me feel less scared to know I was trying my best. And um, one more thing about cancer, guys, because like I do really want to say one more really important thing about cancer. And it's, uh, which is not like my whole thing in life, but I just want to say that like, uh, I remember vividly the last hair on my arm that fell out. Cause like your skin becomes super soft and like there's no hair on it, like anywhere. And like, you don't think you have like hair here, but cause you have peach fuzz, but you know, when everything falls out that you actually had peach fuzz like here or like I had peach fuzz in areas that I don't even think I had hair. Like am I, you know, excuse me for saying that, but like, you know, you just everywhere on like your neck, on your chest, like you just didn't realize that we have peach fuzz. Um, but anyway, the point of saying that is that there was the last hair on my arm and um, it was the last one. And I remember that one made me cry when it was gone the next day. And I wrote um, what's going to be a chapter in my book was the first chapter. And it was all about uh, me and that last hair. So at first you don't know what I'm talking about because I'm like, you know, talking to this one hair and you don't realize it's a hair, but it at that time was my friend because it's the only hair in my arm left and, you know, praying for it to still be there in the morning so you wouldn't have to be alone. And it was really beautiful. And um, I read that before coming here today because I wanted to remember what you just said, like, remember where you came from, you know, remember where you came from, remember what you saw. And then all of a sudden, when I started saying that to you, because I'm so visual, what I see is I see this beautiful, exotic childhood, and I see death in the waiting rooms, you know, waiting room for, you know, getting treatment. And I see life and, you know, delivering my sister's baby uh, a week after, you know, it was over. And I see, you know, um, healing by being able to talk about this and share it with others. And hopefully it's going to bring something new. Uh, and that's what moving with my heart is moving in my truth. So I'm sharing the story and I know that I'm going to make a friend from the story because this story is going to resonate with someone, someone who wants help saving their hair and wants to like obsess with someone on the phone or someone who is waiting two weeks to get diagnosed or has a family member or someone young who shouldn't have this disease and, um, you know, or someone who is not taking care of their health and their stress management or their heart. Because I really want to say that I had a very hard time three years prior to getting diagnosed with cancer. And about a month or two before, I literally felt very week. And the reason I bring this up is because we're on the Melissa Wood Health podcast and it's important. She says to us quite often to listen to your body and, you know, say what you want. You're preaching the right things. You're teaching us the right things. Listen to your body. Green juice is the truth. It is truly the truth. The nutrients that we have in our organic green juices are better than any vitamins you can take. Uh, movement, listen to your body. She was a vegan, now she eats meat. Your body knows, your body talks to you. And I think being here with you, I think it's really important to tell you on behalf of me and all of the females that are watching you, Thank you. You're teaching us things and you're giving us tools that help us. When I walk with you in a public area, it is like the biggest celebrity friend I've ever had. And it's all these amazing we women and females who you've touched, who you've helped, who you've uh, given tools to. And you came out very strong 
during the pandemic, you came out and you helped a lot of females. And whether or not you were present in the way that you wanted to be, you were present in inspiring me. Because when I was going through that period, I was thinking, wow, Melissa is living her dream. She's teaching people nice things. She's making people really happy. She's uh, being a good citizen of the world. And she's thriving. And it inspired me because I thought, thought oh, wow, I'm going to get healthy and I'm going to like thrive and it's going to be awesome. And I'm going to make my dreams come true. And those are the tools I'm going to remember. So thank you. Thank you on behalf of all those females who like come up to you and tell, I've seen so many say how much you've saved them and how much you taught them. And that's great. It's amazing. It's a very powerful energy to have. And you're showing up for it by bringing your community and your friends here and teaching us um, that I take the award for talking more than you today. <laughs> I love you. Is it just another so lesson? Truly. The one who talks more, learns less. <laughs> Don't do it at home. <laughs> I love you so much. It was so cool. 